Welcome back to Finding Om, a podcast about life, spirituality, and mental well-being. This is our third episode. I can't believe it. We're already on number three, and time is flying. Today, we'll be discussing the concepts behind exposure therapy for anxiety. It's one of my favorite concepts within psychiatry, so I figured doing an episode on this might be worthwhile. Since we'll be discussing psychiatric topics today, I want to preface all of this by saying that this is not medical or psychiatric advice. This is just for educational purposes. If you need mental health treatment, please talk to your doctor. Discuss it with your primary care provider. From there, you can get referred to a therapist or a psychiatric provider or both, depending on what you're looking for. A really good website to use is psychologytoday.com. There, you can punch in your zip code, select your insurance, and voila, you can find therapists or psychiatrists in your area who accept your insurance. Also, since this is our first episode specifically about a psychiatric topic, I wanted to give you a little background about myself so that you know I'm talking from some type of experience rather than just Googling everything. I'm a physician and board-certified psychiatrist. I started out as a flight surgeon in the Air Force before I went to psychiatry residency training at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Currently, I practice outpatient psychiatry via telemedicine, and I'm also a clinical instructor at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. All right, now that that's out of the way, let's get down to the topic at hand. What is exposure therapy? Well, first let's talk about anxiety. There are different types of it, of course, and exposure therapy is best used at targeting specific anxieties, such as phobias and social anxiety. For instance, if you have a specific anxiety about how you interact in social situations, feeling judged by others, anxiety about public speaking, or anxiety about driving or flying in airplanes, things like that. For other things like generalized anxiety, techniques like cognitive behavioral therapy or acceptance and commitment therapy may be well suited, but definitely talk to your therapist about that more, and of course, uh, those may be topics for other episodes. Now, with specific anxieties like the ones I mentioned, there's kind of a way that the anxiety plays out in the mind. It starts, the anxiety ramps up to a peak, and then it diminishes when you leave that situation or environment. The interesting thing about this type of anxiety is, The more you avoid something that makes you anxious, the more anxious you become about that thing. But let's go through an example to really understand this. So let's say I have a phobia of driving. Maybe it's because I was in a car accident, or maybe it's because I had to learn to drive late in life, whatever it is. The more I avoid driving, the worse my driving phobia becomes. The concept behind exposure therapy is... If I can expose myself to increasing amounts of driving over time, I can desensitize myself to that feeling and conquer my anxiety. The more I avoid driving, the more sensitized to it I become, and the higher my anxiety is when I try to go back to it after a long time. Exposure therapy is crucial because it's all about exposing oneself to the anxiety-provoking thing over time, starting at low intensity and moving to high. Now, let's say I have a driving phobia, like I mentioned. I don't want to all of a sudden throw myself into driving in New York City or on an extremely busy highway. This would be called flooding. Essentially, my system would be overwhelmed by anxiety, and I would either go into survival mode or shut down completely, kind of fight or flight. And this is not healthy and certainly won't help me overcome my anxiety. So let's go through what exposure therapy might look like in an example like this. Let's say for my driving phobia, I can't even get into the car at this point, okay? That's how severe the anxiety is. What I might do in this case is start by making scenarios on paper. I know this might sound odd, but hang in there with me. So I'd write down a scenario with as much vivid detail as I can. So I might write about me grabbing my car keys, uh, prepping to go outside, noticing my palms being sweaty as I grip the keys tightly in my hand, my anxiety slowly ramping up, and my heart rate increasing as I move towards the door, hesitating before I get into the car, and thinking in my mind, can I just go back inside? Uh, Finally getting into the car, gripping the steering wheel tightly as my forehead starts to sweat, and my heart races even faster. So you get the idea. 
going through a whole scenario of, let's say, me driving to the grocery store would be a good idea, writing down details of what my anxiety feels like in my body, what kind of thoughts go through my brain, things like that. So I have the completed scenario written down in front of me, and what I want to do is designate about 20 to 30 minutes per day to go through the scenario in my mind multiple times. And I'm saying really going through the scenario, noticing my own anxiety, noticing how I feel physically and mentally, really getting into the scenario. What I also want to do is write down my level of anxiety on a scale of 1 to 10. You start with writing it down before doing the scenario, during the scenario, at the peak level of anxiety, and then after the scenario. What I'll notice is my anxiety will be low to moderate before the scenario. It'll be like an 11 out of 10 at the peak, and then it'll slowly come down. The importance of writing this down is, what I'll notice is as I do the exercise over and over again within that 20 to 30 minutes, my peak level of anxiety will decrease over time. And this is the desensitization I mentioned earlier. And writing it down is important so that my brain can really realize that my anxiety is, in fact, decreasing. I really want that concept to click in my mind. After I do these scenarios and I have some progress with the anxiety, I want to then move into the real-life part of exposure therapy, or what we call in vivo exposure. In vivo in Latin meaning within the living. So going back to our example, if at this point I can't even get into my car, we'll start slowly. I'll go outside, get into my car, sit for a few minutes, and come back in. Next time, I'll get into my car, leave my parking spot, and then park again. And then the next day, I'll get into my car, drive to the grocery store, and back. So you get the drift. It's a gradually escalating level of anxiety over time, desensitizing me to the distress and making me less uncomfortable in that situation. Eventually, I'll get to a point where my level of anxiety in actual driving, even for long distances, will be a two or a three. The anxiety will still be there at some level, but it'll be low and manageable. So there you have it, folks, a crash course in exposure therapy. It's, of course, better to do this type of technique with your therapist or doctor, and the reason why I wanted to explain this concept is so that we can understand it and possibly be more open to it if we find there's something like this holding us back in life. Exposure therapy is really helpful in conquering certain anxieties really effectively and permanently at times. Also keeping in mind medications can be helpful. And of course medications and therapy work really well together as many studies have shown. I compare it to things like high cholesterol. You take a medication for high cholesterol, which certainly helps and is extremely important to lower your risk of heart disease, but if you can also incorporate lifestyle and diet changes, it'll be that much more effective. And one big point is this. Avoidance can really make anxiety worse. If we get anxious in crowds, we can avoid going to the grocery store, which our brain will tell us that we want to do, but our anxiety will only increase. So we have to do what's counterintuitive to the brain at times. So I wanted to tell you guys a story about myself as a bit of self-disclosure and in hopes that it might be helpful to talk about to normalize things. Years ago, when I was a flight surgeon, I had taken a course called the Aircraft Mishap Investigation Course. And while there, I, along with the other flight docs, had to simulate investigating past aircraft crashes and mishaps. This involved going over photos of the crash, looking over all the details of the mission, and listening to the cockpit voice recordings of the flights over and over again to try to figure out what human factors may have been involved behind the crash. You can imagine listening to the cockpit voice recordings over and over again, hearing the last words of the crew. It was definitely a challenging part of the whole experience. Well, I went back to my base after the training, and uh, as a flight doc, part of the job is flying with pilots on aircraft, and I found that each time I flew, I was extremely nervous, sweaty, and, you know, when you're on a military aircraft, you're all talking on the in-flight radio, and all I could think was, are these the last words that our families will hear? You know, it was really irrational, but in the moment, it was difficult for me to recognize that. 
So back then, of course, I wasn't a psychiatrist, but I had a friend from medical school who is a brilliant psychiatrist who I definitely will have on the podcast at a later point. And I talked to him about this issue, and he recommended exposure therapy, and he gave me advice about it. I ended up using this technique to completely get over this temporary irrational fear. So this exposure therapy concept can be applied to a lot of different issues with different causes. As you guys know, I like to relate these types of scientific topics to something outside of science to make it more relatable or see how it generally applies to the whole world. Can we apply the concept of exposure therapy to something else in our culture? Well, one thing that comes to my mind is tolerance. And yes, I know, you're thinking, what? How does this relate? But just stay with me and it'll make sense. So a few years back, I watched a TED Talk by Christian Picciolini, a guy who had a very difficult childhood and who at a young age had joined a white supremacist neo-Nazi group. Of course, they drew him in and appealed to a lot of his vulnerabilities at the time, as often these kinds of groups do. He actually went on to become a very important leader in the neo-Nazi movement. I definitely recommend watching his TED Talk, and I'll include a link to it in the episode description. So of course, during this time when he's in the movement, he was being radicalized. He was hating people of color, other cultures, religions. It was so bad that he ended up stockpiling weapons, preparing for a war that wouldn't happen. He even wrote and performed white power music. He was really entrenched in the movement. Now, interestingly, he met a woman who was not a part of the movement. They got married, and at 19, they had their first son. Keep in mind, he had joined the neo-Nazi movement when he was 14. He ended up going off the streets, mostly, uh, because he was worried about his family, and he opened up a record store, primarily to sell white power music, but he also stocked the shelves with Main Street music. So he's getting all these different types of customers, and they started to talk to him about different things as they browse the store. And one day, a young African-American kid walks into the store. He seems upset, and Christian asks him what's wrong. And it turns out his mom had been diagnosed with breast cancer. All of a sudden, Christian connected with this guy because his own mother had been diagnosed with breast cancer as well. On another occasion, a gay couple came into the store with their son, and... After talking to them, he realized that they really loved their son just as much as he loved his own son. So a big change happened in him. He took the white power music off the shelves. Now, unfortunately, the white power music was a big source of income for the store since people from all over the country would come to buy the music. All of a sudden, it became a regular record store. Profits dropped, and he couldn't sustain the business, had to shut it down, and his livelihood. He walked away from the movement entirely. Unfortunately, in the string of everything that happened, he lost his livelihood, his main support system, which was the movement, and also his wife and son, because they had left him prior to his change, and he didn't have a good relationship with his parents. So he was pretty lost at the time, and uh, he ended up getting a job at IBM through a connection, and he actually had to go and install computers at his old high school. He ended up running into an African-American security guard who he had gotten into a lot of fights with back in the day and who had actually gotten him kicked out of that high school. He apologized to the security guard who in turn forgave him completely and uh, the guard actually asked Christian to tell his story to more people. So since then he's been telling his story to everyone, giving talks, lectures, things like that. So later he ends up writing a memoir and gets contacted by someone who was upset with the way the book ended in that he got out of the movement. And this guy, his name was Daryl, who had contacted him, was a military veteran who had been upset that he didn't get a chance to go to Afghanistan to kill Muslims. So Christian ends up flying out to meet him in upstate New York, and he simply asked Daryl, have you ever met a Muslim person before? And Daryl hadn't. So Christian ended up calling a local imam, uh, an imam is a Muslim priest, and they sat down and talked, and turns out they spent two and a half hours talking. And Daryl and this imam became friends. And Christian did this type of thing with over a hundred people, helping them disengage from extremist groups. And the reason I draw a line between this and exposure therapy is that hatred comes from a lack of exposure. And a lack of exposure causes fear, anxiety, and anger. People who have vulnerabilities and are isolated from people of other cultures, colors, or faiths 
they are more prone to extremist ideologies, being recruited by these types of movements because of anxiety and fear. So similar to exposure therapy for phobias or anxiety, we can use exposure therapy for extremism and hatred. And of course, with any of these topics, we combine exposure with empathy and compassion. The problem is, if we just yell at extremists, they won't change their minds and they'll just become more entrenched in their existing viewpoints. More on that, listen to my last episode on cognitive dissonance. But if we can use a different strategy, we might be more successful. It's all about hearts and minds, right? And I know this idea of exposure therapy for hatred sounds intuitive or common sense, and it is, honestly, it is. But I feel it's not practiced very much, at least not widespread, in terms of rehabilitating people who have been caught up in these types of movements. All right, folks, that's it for this episode. I really hope you guys enjoyed this one. Exposure therapy is by far one of my favorite topics in psychiatry because I love the concept and because it helps a lot of people. I can tell you one thing, any patient of mine who ended up doing exposure therapy either with me or with a therapist, it helped them no matter what. It's that effective. So if you're interested, look it up, read about it, and make an appointment with a therapist or ask your doctor about it. It can be life-changing. As always, thank you so much for listening and for all of your support. If you'd like to know more about what we do, visit findingohm.org. If you'd like to contact us to ask a question, send a comment, or maybe you want to collaborate on something, email us, info at findingohm.org. I appreciate you lending me your ears and listening to this podcast, especially in this world where it can be so difficult to sit down and listen to something for any prolonged period of time. Thank you, thank you, and till next time, friends. Thank you.